Do anyone, does anybody here know what open mic is? There's a bunch of performers around. Yeah. Oh. Anything. I'm an open mic gypsy. We're the wannabes. The almost famous, the has been famous, the never going to be famous. We're the next wave, the new wave. For some of us, it's going to be an endless wave. I died. <laughs> I'll show up for the opening of a bodega. You give me five minutes and a microphone. <laughs> open mic is our training wheels, it's our mistress, and it's our siren's call. Who are we? We're the aging Mulberry Street guinea comic whose jokes now mock the Guido Sopranos Jersey Shore white beater t-shirt image of himself is so carefully constructed and played out for most of his life. With that radical swap more lesbo who chooses to press now without signs or words displaying her flawless porcelain body in burlesque reviews that ridicule our obsession with fame and sexuality while titillating male tourists' imaginations with the possibilities of wonders that will never be. We're the English lit PhD bullied by the kids on his block for being an uppity nigger too smart for his own damn good. Well, now he's relentlessly rapping and slamming his truth on open mic. No apologies and no regrets. And in your fucking face, brother. We're the second generation freckled mick singing songs of rebellion and anarchy to Irish comrades in a homeland that only exists on St. Paddy's Day when we're drunk. We're that skateboarding middle class Jap kid who grew up in the Beatles and rock and roll. He wants to put his own stamp on our music. He's got to work in his mom's sushi joint till that happens. With a lapsed Catholic ex-altar boy, too damaged for any real relationship, whose poems cry out his loss of faith after being irreverently probed as a child by his parish priest. With a self-educated beaner bus boy, studying English and writing poems on a park bench, who dreams in vain of being a real waiter someday and replacing that pretty white girl who smiles enticingly at him while stealing part of their shared tips to feed her habit. <clears throat> with the Afghan war bird out, who traded bullets and IEDs for shots of heroin and Jameson to ease the pain, while writing diaries of a love lost in Ohio and drifting off into combat nightmares at AA meetings. We're the gifted Israeli artist, who unmarried, unapologetic, and rejected by her community for the crime of being single and female at 40, she now blesses the locals here with tattoos of exquisite beauty and sings songs joyously of a new love. With that dropout fag college student from Levittown who didn't fit his parents' expectations of who he was supposed to be, but who fits perfectly into a slinky lame cocktail gown and stilettos for stand-up routine, and who turns tricks on the side for more money than his father makes in a month. Or the Hasidic Jew boy, dropped acid, trekked the Himalayas and became a Buddhist monk, spilling out saffron rap poems of beauty and oneness on street corners to passers-by who will not listen. Or the pimple-faced kid from the burbs, escaping a boring, boring, tedious life, popping oxy from mom's medicine cabinet till he leaves home to sing a story down here. Or the New Eureka street boy from Avenue B, who graffitis his way into showing the prominent village galleries, raps his shit on open mic, and gets to fuck a beautiful blonde white girl from Minneapolis, which is all he ever really wanted. And we're all here, downtown, in the village, on open mic. The line in the sand is 14th Street. You cross it, you take your chances. You're in our world now. Thank you. Anybody remember Johnny E? Jai does. Well, I didn't think so. You could always find Johnny E. in the last seat at the end of the bar for happy hour at the Continental over on First Avenue near 7th Street. Three Fingers Bushmill, neat, always dressed to the nines, with carefully arranged and shellacked comb over, and wearing that classic powder blue polyester sport coat he got 40 years ago in 1972 on his way back from Vietnam. Hey, Johnny E., I haven't seen you for a long time. Where you been? Uh, Fucking ambulance took me to emergency at Bellevue instead of the VA hospital. Eight weeks I'm there with pneumonia, and then they tell me I got a bad liver to boot. Goddamn landlord rents out my apartment to a woman with a kid because he hasn't seen me. He thinks I'm dead. 35 years of my life he throws in a fucking dumpster. And my car's missing. I go down to the tow pound, they auction off my car for 75 bucks. They said I owe $2,000 in fines and storage fees and shit. I got 486 bucks in my saving account. I'm running out of fucking options here, you know what I mean? He spends happy hours at the International for a few more weeks until the stash runs out. Just trying to keep warm and keep a little buzz going. So weather's getting colder. 
can't handle it, ain't working anymore. I run into him again. He's sleeping on a heat vent over by the Chase Bank on 2nd Avenue. I spot him at 20. I say, hey, Johnny E., how you doing? Rejoice, rejoice. We got no choice, right? Maybe I need to try the VA again, huh? I was a door gunner with a Huey back in Nami, you know? Company A, 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry. I lit up a lot of fucking VC with that big 50 man. No retreat, no surrender, right, brother? They owe us something. I don't see Johnny anymore that winter, at the street or at the International. Late one night, I'm over at the black and white bar with tents and shooting shit with Harry the Hat. Out of nowhere, he says, Hey, remember Johnny? Frank and the cop tells me they found him dead over at the St. Mark's Hotel back in March. He was laying face down in the Swanson uh, TV dinner. Mac and cheese, I think he said. Still wearing that fucking polyester sport coat, too. You know what was sad? Frankie said nobody claimed his body. Can you believe that shit? Hey, Billy. Three fingers Bushville, neat. But Johnny O. No retreat, no surrender. Fucking A, brother. Thank you. It's late. I'm sitting alone at the bar working on my fourth double jack, and I'm feeling pretty mellow. She leans across two seats, taps me on the shoulder, stares me dead in the face, and says, You look like Pablo Picasso. <laughs> She's really pretty. I mean, I guess late 30s, early 40s, maybe. She's got nice cheekbones, great body, packed in tight black leather. Her hair is long and straight and dyed black, and her bangs are almost covering those haunted, crazy eyes. That's exactly the woman I've always been a sucker for. <laughs> Pablo Picasso, I bet you get that all the time, huh? Uh, no, not really. She spots my fancy camera sitting on the bar. Hey, you're a photographer? Sometimes, mostly I tell stories. She flashes a Cheshire cat. Hey, me too. And she drifts off into some rambling drug story with a bunch of lame attempts at being funny. You know, everything you say seems to have a sardonic twist of some kind at the end, like a comedian or something. And she smiled, well, that's because I am a comedian. Really? What kind of comedy do you do? She says, da-da. A da-da comedian. Right. Could she really be that hip? She asked me, what kind of comedy do you do? And I, I'm not a comic. I'm a, I tell stories. And she says, well, I'm sure my stories are a lot better than yours. As she slowly moves her face and her lips in close to an attack position. I have a Speedo at home that's older than you. You know that, right? She dusts me off saying, you couldn't come close to my stories. You ever done crack? Uh, no, I stopped at mescaline and cocaine. Obviously, you didn't. She again ignores my comment and she says, well, tell me what kind of comedians you like. Sarah Silverman, uh, Andy Kaufman, I guess Richard Pryor and Lenny Bruce are my all-time favorites. They always took everything right to the edge and then they jumped off regardless of the consequences. Wow. You know, everybody thinks I am Sarah Silverman. <laughs> really? Well, I can see that. Actually, in a dark bar with a lot of drinks with me, she does look like Sarah Silverman. <laughs> and Andy Kaufman is my hero. He was my role model. <clears throat> she rests her hand on my thigh. My Seattle's instantly kicks in. <laughs> Tell my body I'm 40 years old again. And Jack Daniels is agreeing with him. He's whispered in my head, go for it, man. You could do this. <laughs> She seems pretty intelligent. She's somewhat creative, attractive, very sexy, and very fucked up. Just my kind of girl. So. <laughs> she one of my cards. I, I ask her to come to my next show. <laughs> Why do they still entice me, these beautiful, intelligent crazies? <laughs> do they still see the leftover crazy in these old eyes behind the wrinkles and the beat-up face? Shouldn't she be able to see in me that it doesn't work? I'm living proof. I have the scars of all the battles lost with drugs, booze, and crazy. More important, why do we get this incredible magnetism and electrical shit going around? It feels good, and I miss it. Is it uh, just the Seattle's, the Jack Daniels, purely a chemical reaction? I don't think so. I know better, but... Still, I want to throw her in the back of a 60 Triumph Bonneville, race off to some cheap motel and make hard bandit love to her. We're crazy. That's what we do, ain't it? Worry about it tomorrow. Fuck it. We're both losers. We're heading for a Bonnie and Clyde ending. Pablo Picasso, Sarah Silverman.
two fucked up souls irreversibly driving into a head-on, dead-on collision. She leans in and she hugs me way too tight. And I feel myself wanting a lot more, but you know, sometimes age actually imparts little bits of wisdom. And I pick up my camera and I head for the door and I hear her yelling behind me, Hey, Pablo, why are you leaving, man? Well, I've been in this same sad movie too many times. It always ends bad, and I just don't want to be around for that anymore. <laughs> I'm eight years old, I know one thing for sure. I love my mother. At 12, I think I love Jesus. At 14, I love Maureen, but she likes my best friend. At 16, I'm in love with Cass, but I'm dating her best friend. At 18, I'm just angry. I think nobody loves me. I hate everybody. At 21, Rosie's really in love with me. And for almost a year, I'm too drunk to notice that she's a hooker. <laughs> and too drunk to care because I didn't even love her. At 23, I'm madly in love with Carol. We're even engaged until she dumps me at 25 when I confess I really want to be an actor and not the middle class banker that I promised her. I know I'm being selfish, but I'm still heartbroken. At 26, Sharon and I are deeply in love, but she constantly tortures me with flirtations and endless tests to prove that I love her. After three years of fights, anxiety, exhaustion, I just quit loving her. It's then she tries to become the woman I thought I originally fell in love with. It's too late, it's over. She asked me if we could at least be fuck buddies. I said, sure, okay. <laughs> at 30, I'm in love with Eileen, but it's the onset of women's liberation. She weighs our relationship in terms of what her women's support group feels is appropriate. She dumps me because they tell her that I'm too sexist, not a sensitive enough guy. She leaves a parting message on my answering machine saying, Thank you. You helped me grow. Grow what, a dick? <laughs> At 32, I'm living with Susan. Oh, she's a free spirit. She feels an open sexual relationship is necessary to fulfill herself as a woman. She runs off to Canada to live in a teepee with some hippie. She leaves her needy sister behind in my apartment until I work up the courage to kick her out. I sleep with a lot of women during those summers of free love. I don't have much fun. And I got to clap three times. A friend offers a telling observation. She says, you know all the women you think you fall in love with? They're really the same fucked up person. They just look different. <laughs> wow. Moment of clarity here. <laughs> it's true. She offers me a date with her best friend to prove her point. And I believe I feel real love for the very first time. But here I am, 40 years later, and I find myself still wondering, what the hell is love? And I realize now I may never know. The feeling now seems more an abstraction rather than a tangible sensation. <clears throat> At this late stage of my life, I feel like I know as little about love as when I started out. I'm very grateful for all the love I've been given, but I have no clear feeling for how much I ever honestly returned. Thank you. This is the only poet piece I ever wrote that rhymed. I don't know where it came from. I think it might think it's a song or something. <laughs> a broke, a broke down old drunk man stumbling down First Avenue in the rain. He's trying hard not to slide away, held up mostly by his cane. With his good arm, he's supporting a girl with a swelled up foot that hurts, slow steps moving forward and jerking and staggering back in spurts. She's hanging on tight, teeth clenched, fighting him hard to hold back screams of pain. She hoists her broke umbrella, struggling for cover from this rain. Two poor lost souls, knowing they can't do it on their own, stumbling down First Avenue, trying hard together to find a way back home. Just a broke down old drunk man and a pretty young thing in pain. On the way to purgatory in this godforsaken rain. In case you haven't figured it out, most of these are true stories. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why my wife doesn't come. <laughs> okay. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse from. Wait a minute. 
Weren't we all part of that refugee, wretched refuse? Weren't we the outcasts, the freaks, the faggots, the tattooed rockers, the weirdos, the nerds, the techno geeks from all those puckered ass towns in the middle of America where we were ridiculed, bullied, and beat up? We came here to the village. Immigrants from that other America seeking refuge, freedom to let out the crazy creative shit inside. What happened? This was the village, Bohemia, home of free thought. When did we submit to politically correct? We let Giuliani and Bloomberg sucker us into some great Isle of New York theme park? Is anything left to experience for real down here? Washington Sparks Park has been cleaned up and made pristine. Tompkins Square Park is a playground for kids and dogs. They don't want you there anymore drinking and smoking weed. East Village has been gentrified, so you better be careful out there, John Brennan. <laughs> Never. Little Italy. Little Italy, mean streets, gangsters, bookies, social clubs, mafia. They're all gone. Nothing left but a couple tourist trap restaurants and some fake festivals it was swallowed up whole by Chinatown, <laughs> Times Square, Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, the Lion King, I Love New York T-shirts. The flea circus is gone. Dollar hot dogs are gone. The midnight movie triple features are gone. The religious soapbox crazies and the Harlem hustlers are gone. The sleazy jerk-off peep shows, dive bars, training hookers, loose joints. Everything's gone. Where do we get the provender for new stories, new adventures? Manhattan was always scary, but it was real, it was exciting. It fed the veins of generations of art junkies. The village. We're just another stop on the Bay Line bus tour now. We've all become background extras for those daily deluge of tour buses, TV, and film crews. They're invading our neighborhood, trying to package our environment, hoping to add some local color and excitement to their bland, made for middle American TV shows and movies. They think they're making art. It's video junk food. Made for those same assholes and bullies we thought we left behind in shit city USA. Now we're safely contained and declawed like zoo animals. They gawk at us when they ride by on those double-decker buses. Or we enter the homes safely locked up in caged as background images on those widescreen high-def TV sets. Our silent submission gives them permission to look down on us and feel superior. You know there's a village bookstore that hosts an open mic where performers like me are specifically requested to not speak five or four-letter words because we might scare off the paying customers. Hey, if words scare you, maybe you should stay the fuck out of bookstores. <laughs> your children shout out those same words every day on their Christian and Orthodox school buses. We hear them. Did George Carter win that fight for us like a long time ago? This is the village. If you don't like it, go back to Yonkers or Oyster Bay or wherever the fuck you come from. <laughs> Where your smiling, genteel neighbors are probably whispering those very same four-letter words about you behind your back. What happened to hang out, drink cheap wine, talk about art, stumbling out of a White Horse Tavern at 2 a.m., smelling wino piss and garbage on hot August sidewalks, wanting desperately to walk in the literary footsteps of O'Neill, Thomas, Coverwack, Ginsburg, Pfeiffer, Dylan, Mailer, Cummings, Corso, Ferlinghetti, and all those immigrant vagabonds who painted portraits with words of the America we wanted to live in. I want to write poems on a midnight fire escape under moonlight. I want to make fast, intense love in a dark tenement doorway while the lowest sight of fighting cock hurled in the sunrise. I want to sing the song of my life to the world on a park bench with a guitar. I want to get wild, get crazy, get creative, get arrested, get high. I just got to feel alive again. You know, fuck it, man. Maybe we should all dress up like beatniks and hippies and take pictures with the tourists for money and be done with it. <laughs> Welcome to the I Love New York theme park. <laughs> <laughs>